tell a story on our videographer tonight. Sunday, <coughs> he, he gets this look every now and again when I say something about it. Sunday, he came up to me after the service and he said, man, I don't know um, how this happened, but I didn't, the, the camera didn't have enough memory to record the whole service, the whole sermon Sunday. I said, that's fine. I had two people come up to me during lunch Sunday and said, I hope we got a copy of that sermon. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, I finally preach a good one and there's no evidence. <laughs> None at all. It's the Lord's work. It's the Lord's work. It's marvelous in our sight. All right. Well, tonight we want to continue our study on defending your faith and we want to uh, begin what's really going to be a two-part study. We're going to look at one question uh, tonight and another question next time. Uh, but the main question that's driving these two sessions is, does science disprove the Bible? And I am very intentional in how I phrase that question. Because there's multiple ways you could go about answering this question. Multiple ways you go about looking at this subject. And so tonight I want us to look kind of at the larger issue, and then we're going to look at one specific example, that the issue of creation, and, and what science and creation, how that all works together. And then um, next time we're going to look at the issue of miracles, and, uh, and how science, and how do we deal with uh, science and the, the concept of miracles. I'm giving you to start off with just a verse from 1 Corinthians 8. It's really the latter part of that verse that I want us to think about, where Paul says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And, and knowledge is important, and I think we should want to be intelligent people, to be people who are um, knowledgeable about the truth and about the world that God created and, and all that God has in the universe for us to know. But we should never let knowledge distort uh, us to the point that it makes us arrogant and boastful and obnoxious and know-it-alls. Um, nobody likes a know-it-all. Okay? Nobody likes somebody that uh, knows everything about everything. Okay? Uh, one thing that you learn as you go through a period of education, at least if it's a good education, is how little you really do know. And it hopefully would open up a quest to want to know more. But it should never puff up or build us up uh, in, in an unhealthy way, but instead love builds us up in a, in a way that is honoring and pleasing to God. And that's the goal of a study like this tonight. So, does science disprove the Bible? To answer that question, kind of in a broad statement, the answer is no. But in order to answer that question that way, we first need to ask, what is science? Uh, because in a lot of places, people make this statement. Well, science says. You ever heard someone say, science says. Well, that's really not a good phrase to use because science is a discipline. Science is a way of doing things, not some kind of objective organization or reality that speaks authoritatively all the time. Science is a, is a process. It's a, it's a discipline. The word science itself comes from the Latin word scientia, which just means knowledge. And so science is the rational pursuit of knowledge. That's what science is. Science is not the boogeyman. Science is not evil. Science is just the pursuit rationally of knowledge. Okay? The goal of science is to understand the physical realities of the universe. From the smallest thing we can discern to the vastness of the universe. The goal of science as a discipline is to understand the physical realities of the universe. That is the scope of science. Science achieves this goal uh, by operating under several presuppositions. So things are just kind of taken for granted, understood, foundational realities, primarily that the truth of the universe's physical properties, that those properties are discoverable through rational means. 
And the rational way that science has done this as a discipline is through the development of what's known as the scientific method. Now, when I was in elementary school and in middle school, every year when we took science, the first unit of science was about the scientific method, and that bored me to tears because I'm like, why in the world would we learn these steps? When are we going to start blowing stuff up? And that was really what I wanted to do. And so, <clears throat> but now as I've gotten older, I realize how important it is that you have this method, the scientific method that is the kind of agreed upon process that scientists should use to do what science is supposed to do, which is to discover the physical realities of the universe. So what's the scientific method? Well, it starts off with the hypothesis. You pose a question. Okay. Why is the grass green? That's a question. If I want to figure out why is the grass green, I might make a hypothesis. The grass is green because there's little green people inside of it that make it green. That's my hypothesis. I pose a question. I have a... Educated guess. Yes. I wouldn't say educated if I think it's a little green man. Okay? <laughs> but I have a guess about why that is. Then I design an experiment to test my hypothesis. So if I'm going to see that the grass is green, I'm going to go and I'm going to collect some grass, and I'm going to get a microscope, and I'm going to look for the little green men in the, in the grass that makes the grass green. I'm going to test my hypothesis with an experiment. I'm going to figure out all the parameters. I'm going to make it as, um, as unaffected by outside elements as possible so that I can come to the uh, conclusion about why the grass is green. And so then I'll draw conclusions. And if I do my experiment right, I will discover that there are no little green men in the blades of grass. Instead, it's chlorophyll that makes the grass green. And so I draw those conclusions. Then I would share my findings with others so that they can then do the same experiment again that they to see that I was right, not messed up and had some kind of flaw in my experiment or what have you. That's the scientific method. It's pretty simple. And that works for almost anything uh, when it comes to things. You look at, you know, what do you observe? What do you think? Make a guess, design an experiment, figure out why things work the way they do, draw conclusions, and then let that be repeated. And so if that is how science does what it does, science is therefore observable, which means you can observe what's going on. Okay? It's evidential, which means you have to have the conclusions have to be based on evidence. And it's repeatable and or consistent. Which means it, it happens every time you do the experiment. There's not you know, some grass that has chlorophyll and some that does have little green men in it. Okay? It's consistent across the board in order to be the reality that science is observing. Okay? So it has to be observable, it has to be based on evidence, and it has to be repeatable. Um, that, th those are important parameters. When science ventures out of that realm, when science seeks to do more than science can do, that's when science stops being science and becomes another form of religion. And that is where it becomes dangerous. Because what can happen is that you know, science is by its very nature self limiting in that it is limited to the physical world. Okay, it's limited to the physical realities of what can be seen, touched, and experienced in terms of physical reality. Those kind of, it's limited in that respect. When science goes outside of that to try to answer ultimate questions, like, why? Why are we here? Science is in no way equipped to answer that question. You know, the meaning of life, science is in no way equipped to answer that question. When science tries to step outside of that scope, science can become dangerous, and science can almost become another religion. And I would argue that when people say science says, 
what they're really saying, replace the word science with a naturalistic worldview. If you go back to look a few weeks ago with the idea of worldview. A naturalistic worldview says everything has to have a natural explanation. It's a naturalistic worldview. Science is naturalistic, but it doesn't mean that science has all the answers. I had a philosophy professor who liked to say that he dealt in the questions that no scientist could ever accurately answer. Because there comes a point where science just can't give you the answer. It can give you a lot of evidence. It can give you a lot of conclusions. But it can't give you the ultimate answers of why, meaning of, those kind of things. Often, people will look at the Bible and they'll say, well, we've got so much scientific evidence now that that disproves all that's in the Bible. Now, now here is why that is a complicated statement that people don't realize when they make that statement. Go back to what I said that science was. It's observable, evidential, and repeatable. Anything in history automatically is taken away from that because you can't repeat it. You realize that, right? You can't, I mean, based on the rules of science, how do I know you were born? Can I repeat your birth? Now, we know you're born because you exist, because you're here. There's evidence of it, but it's not repeatable. So, so there is a historical reality of things that have happened in the past that there's evidence for, but to say that it is scientifically provable is a, is a bit of a stretch because you can't repeat it. So this is the realm of history versus the realm of science. That, that, that is a bigger issue than I, than I really want to get into about, but I think it's an important one to at least touch on. So a lot of times people say, well, people back in Bible times, they were operating from a pre-scientific understanding of the universe. And so they spoke about things using language, using terms that we would never use today. Because we're so much more enlightened, we have such a better understanding than they do. You know what that's called? Chronological snobbery. The idea that because you are from a later generation, therefore you know better than the previous generations. That's just not true, is it? The only thing I find really amazing is how in medicine, a lot of the old-timey remedies that were kind of laughed at for a long time are making a comeback. You know? Why? Well, people who lived back then probably knew a little bit more than we give them credit for knowing. You know, there's such a thing as chronological snobbery. C.S. Lewis, in his introduction to uh, St. Athanasius' little book on the Incarnation, which was written in the 4th century A.D., C.S. Lewis in the 1940s, and uh, wrote an introduction to it in a publication of it, he said that, you know, you need to read the old stuff because the old stuff has survived because it stood the test of time across multiple generations. You know, one of the things that's happened is you, you, know, you get a book or you get a, a concept, and in five years, some of that stuff's completely out of date. I mean, I've got books in my library that are less than 10 years old, and the stuff that's in those books is so out of date now that they're really useless. So, you know, read some old stuff, and his recommendation is for every... For one new book you read, read three old ones. At least 100 years old or more. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? Um, so to say that the people back then just didn't understand, they didn't know what we're talking about, that's just chronological snobbery. And it's dangerous. So how can science be reconciled with the Bible? That's the question. And I, I, think there, I don't think there's an inherent conflict. I think one thing we as evangelical Christians need to understand is that science is not the enemy. Okay? Um, there is a, a tendency in the United States today amongst some to be anti-intellectual 
and anti-science. And the problem with that is in order to have a seat at the table to discuss issues, you have to at least be aware of what's going on. And if you automatically put up a wall that says, I don't want to hear that, I don't want to know that, I don't want to think about that, you're never going to be listened to on what you have to say. So I think it's important for us as Christians to be as informed as possible about stuff with which we may vehemently disagree. But we need to at least be aware of what's out there. Okay? Um, I think it's very important, and this is kind of a side note, but it goes along with life, to sharpen your own viewpoints, read people who disagree with you. Because here's what I have found. If there's an issue, whether it's a theological issue, political issue, societal issue, whatever, that I feel very strongly about, it's very easy for me to get into an echo chamber where I only read people who agree with me. But if I read people who disagree with me, one, I become aware of the arguments that they think, and two, I have to sharpen my arguments so I know how to deal with what they're saying. It's a much better thing to do. Okay, So read varying viewpoints on issues, and particularly on science. Read some of these books that are you know, written by atheistic scientists. Read those books. I'm not saying don't. Just read them with a critical eye to use them to sharpen your own perspectives. Okay? It's not, it's not, you know, you're not going to you know, get possessed by a demon by walking into the science section at the bookstore. Okay? You know, the only way you would, you know, something like that would happen is if you were crazy. Okay. But that's another, that's another topic. Okay. So, like I said, tonight we're going to talk about creation. Next time we'll talk about miracles. So with the issue of creation, what does the Bible actually teach? Genesis 1, beginning of the Bible, where creation happens, Right? What does the Bible actually teach about creation? It teaches that God created everything. It teaches that God created by speaking. And that God created good. So three conclusions you can draw from this is one very easily. What the Bible does not teach is the specific time when God created. There was a medieval bishop who believed that the earth was created in the year 4004 B.C. on like a Thursday. I mean, he, he taught, you know, just, well, you know, like going back to like, you know, like September 15th, 4004 B.C. or something. He had like a specific date. The Bible doesn't talk about those things. It says God created it. He created it in seven days. And we'll talk about that because of even how we understand that. But it says he did it and he did it by speaking and it was good. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. What does scientific naturalism teach? You know, this is when people say, what does science say? It's really scientific naturalism. What does it teach? It says that everything that exists is brought about by natural means. It's that naturalistic worldview. That's an assumption. Okay? That's just an assumption. All life emerged as the result of a natural process of gradual evolution. Now, I want to go ahead and say, the word evolution is not a dirty word. All that means is change. Okay? You have evolved, I hope, since you were a baby. Right? You change. That's all that word means. It's not a dirty word. Okay? I know some places you get run out of town if you use even the word evolution. It's not a dirty word. It just means change. Alright? And naturalistic, or scientific naturalism says that it took billions of years to accomplish. Okay? Those are kind of the assumptions. Now, what is scientific naturalism? Not so. I want every single one of you tonight to make me a promise. Quit saying, I don't know if you do this or not, but you might, and if you do, quit it. If you know somebody that doesn't, tell them to stop it. Don't say that the theory of evolution says we evolve from monkeys, because it doesn't. 
Okay? We, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Charles Darwin never said that. No uh, evolutionist has ever said we descended from monkeys. Because here's the argument that really makes us look silly. Well, if we descended from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? You ever heard somebody say that? That's not what evolution teaches. Evolution says that all primates share a common ancestor. That's what it says. Okay? Now, I don't have a problem understanding the Bible, understanding science, and trying somehow to fit those two things together. There's different ways to do it. I want to share with you how a lot of Christians have done that over the course of years. Um, but the theory of evolution in and of itself, Darwin's theory of evolution, Origin of Species, published in 1859. Uh, he wrote additional things um, about um, this theory. Um, you know, it, 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 he was not the only scientist at the time who was thinking these things. He wasn't the only one who was who was questioning kind of the standard understanding of how life emerged. Um, I, you, know, you think what you want to Charles Darwin, he just he's a historical figure, we have to deal with him. The theory of evolution is scientific naturalism's best guess for the evolution or for the origin of life. Scientific naturalism's best guess. Okay, remember that's a worldview, that's a that's a religion in a sense. It's their origin story. It's their best approximation. Since science, as a discipline, is continually adapting and changing based on new evidence, and when new evidence emerges, conclusions are changed. As time progresses, scientific views of things change. Those who hold to a mere religious adherence to scientific naturalism can, can ignore evidence, and often do ignore evidence, that is contrary to their understanding of things. So, scientific naturalism can be just as anti-intellectual as extreme fundamentalist stuff. And I really hope that I think they're just screaming. I don't think they're crying. Okay? And, you know, let well, them well, do it. Okay. So, how do you reconcile this as one of the signs? How do you do that? Well, there have been five primary theories that have been put forward over the years that have been proposed how you reconcile Genesis 1 with scientific conclusions about the age of the universe, the origin of life, so on and so forth. Okay, the first is called the gap theory. The gap theory. This argues that there is an indefinite gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, Genesis 1-1 one, one says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? What it says. What was the first thing that God created? A lot of people say light. But let's read the story. What does the story say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. There's stuff there. <coughs> so here's what the gap theory says. You've got different versions of it, but the main version is, is that God created everything a long, long time ago. Maybe 14, 15 billion years ago. And that there was life, and things existed, and there were plants, and there were stuff, and then at some point, God wiped it all out. 
And what you have in Genesis 1-2 following is the recreation of everything. And so, why do dinosaur fossils look like they were from 65 million years ago? Because there were dinosaur fossils 65 million years ago. That's what the gap theory says. It says that what we have now is just a recreation of what God made. Now, this is a theory. I'm not saying this is, you've got to think you agree with any of these. It's just a theory. Okay? The problem with that theory is that it's not talked about anywhere else in the Bible. But there are some that, that will see that that seems to be possible. <coughs> That's the gap theory. Um, there have been a lot of famous Christians over the years who hold to that view of a gap. Um, the second is called the age-day theory. The word day in Hebrew is the word yom. Yom can mean 24-hour period. But yom can also mean Extended period of time. The day of the Lord. Talk about the Old Testament. The Yom Yahweh. The day of the Lord is not a literal 24 hour day. It's a period of time. So these theorists hold that the six days of active creation work are not six literal 24 hour days, but are instead periods of time in which God created. Because God is not bound by time like we are. You know, the day to God is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. So they'll argue that to God you have days. And they'll say, well, you don't have the sun and the moon till day four. If you don't have the sun and moon, how can you reckon days? Okay. The problem with that theory is that the order of creation doesn't fit with what science would argue, because you have life before you have the sun, and, and there's issues with the ordering and those kind of things. So, so, so those are some of the issues that that theory presents, but that's a very popular theory amongst evangelical Christians, that a day does not equal 24 hours. So it's just, God made it, may have taken it a million years, may have taken it in three seconds. He did it, okay? Um, those, both of those theories would fall in the category of what's called Old Earth Creationism. Old Earth Creationism. The idea that the Earth is actually as old as scientific evidence has been interpreted to believe. 4.5 approximate billion years old. You know, and here's a question I asked a guy one time. I said, you know, when you're 4.5 billion do you care if you're a million or so off? And he said, not really. So you're just kind of getting approximate there, okay? So they would argue for an old age of the universe, um, the universe 14 to 15 billion years old. Um, and, and the reason they say it's 14 to 15 billion years old is because of light years. Light travels at approximately 186,000 miles per second. So it takes about nine minutes from the light of the sun to reach the earth. So the sun could have exploded nine minutes ago, and we don't know it yet. Okay? It takes millions of years for the light of a star to reach us. Okay? When I was a kid, we were learning about light and science. I remember on a clear night, I would go outside with a flashlight. And I would turn it on, and I would just point up the sky. And I would think, I'm sending that a long, long way away. Okay? And guess what? That beam of light is technically still traveling somewhere out in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay? Um, I, I, mean, I think our universe is cool. So that's the age, day, and the gap theory. The third theory, this would fall under young Earth creation. Uh, idea. It's called the ideal time theory. It's the idea that, that God created everything at an ideal age. And the argument of the ideal time theory is that when God made Adam, 
He didn't make him, apparently, did not make him as a baby and he'd grow up. He was a fully grown adult who was only a day old. So he looked older than he actually was. Does that make sense? So the idea is that, yes, the earth looks old, but it's not because God made it to look old. That's the ideal time period. Now, there's a theological problem with that, that it makes God out to be a little bit deceptive. Because, I mean, he gives us a brain to figure stuff out, and then, oh, sorry, fooled you, it's really not that old. But there's a lot of folks that that's how they reconcile and say, well, of course, you know, the earth looks billions of years old because that's how God made it to look. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip forward and come back to it. Um, Number five, they have a flood theory. Uh, when we went to Kentucky, we went to the ark, and this is the theory that the Answers in Genesis people hold to, and that is the earth is only about 6,000 years old. The reason it looks so old is because of the traumatic experience of the flood. And that's the argument that for those folks give, that you know you, you, you have this huge trauma of the waters of the flood and all that, it just it makes mountains... You know, look more, and it makes canyons, it does all this, you know, deposits fossils and all this kind of stuff. Okay? Um, and so that argument is, is that the reason the earth looks old is it's just been distressed. And it's kind of like the earth is not showing its age real well because the flood was so traumatic. Okay? So ideal time and flood theory are both young earth views, but the earth is less than 10,000 years old. A, the fourth one, is, I should have made the fifth one, I apologize, uh, is called the pictorial day theory. This was actually the theory that most of the early Christian theologians held to. That you don't read Genesis 1 literally. That Genesis 1 is to tell us that God created, and to tell us that God is a God of order, and that God is a God who creates well, and God creates things good, but that it's not intended to give the specifics of how he did it. And people like St. Augustine and other early church uh, leaders looked at the creation stories of other religions and compared it. You know, the, the Romans and the Greeks had their own creation myths, and they were very bloody. In the Babylonian creation myth is, is interesting. The, the gods were fighting, and one god took a sword and cut another god in half, and his top half became the sky, and his bottom half became the earth. That was how they explained the creation of the universe. The Egyptians believed that there were two gods who had carnal relations, and that's how everything came about. So, so this is a, a story that the early church leaders saw as being very... Um, Orderly and it says a lot more about God than it does about us. It's a theological story, not a scientific story. That was some of their views. It's called the pictorial day theory. These are just pictures of creation. Here's the good news about all this. Okay? And this is why I get excited about this. When we get to heaven, if we find out that the gap theory was right, and we held to the flood theory, guess what? It's not going to matter. <laughs> okay? It's not going to matter at all. So why do I even share any of this? I share it tonight so that you are aware that as Christians, we can still believe the Bible is the Word of God and still believe that there are things to be learned and understood and studied in the world, and those things are not inherently contradictory. Do I have all the answers? No. Do I know which theory is right? Probably a sixth theory that I've never heard of okay, is right. Um, I do think there are some theological conclusions that we need to hold on to regardless of what theory we hold to. First is that God is the creator. Um, if you believe that God is the creator, the means by which God did it are not essential for salvation. 
Okay, just, you just affirm God as the creator. If you go back to some of the ancient creeds, you know, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. He's the one who makes everything, creates everything. He's the source of it all. In him we live and move and have our being. The specifics of that, I wasn't there. You know, just like God asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Well, God, um, a little outside of my pay grade. Okay. Secondly, that God made humanity as a special creation. Now, from a theological perspective, I think it's a little more important that you look at humanity's creation as a, in a more literal sense than the creation itself. I think it is theologically necessary to have a literal Adam and Eve. Okay? To have a, a literal first parents. And the reason is because the fall into sin. Genesis 3 makes the necessity of a literal first family essential. Because if you have people who are not descended from Adam and Eve, then when you get to Romans 5, and Paul says, in Adam all sinned, in Christ all are saved, that doesn't make sense if you've got somebody who's descended from Bob. Not Adam. Okay. Now here's one question that I get asked a lot by children and teenagers and some adults. Okay? And it's in Genesis 4. And this is just to show you that sometimes the Bible does not um, answer the questions that we have. It just assumes some things. Okay? Who was the first person God made? Adam. Who was his wife? Eve. Eve. Okay. Who was the first son of Adam and Eve? Cain. Second son? Abel. Abel. Who killed who? Cain killed Abel. Okay. So, in Genesis 4, you've been introduced to four people, one of whom is now dead. Genesis 4, verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived. So here's the question I get asked a lot. Where did Cain's wife come from? Okay? The Bible doesn't answer that question. Okay? Um, you know, we may not like to think of this, but from a literal rendering of the text, it would more than likely be his sister. Okay? So, you know, do with that as you will. But the Bible doesn't answer those questions. Okay? Unfortunately, that has also been used to explain some things throughout history that have ended up going down a pretty bad path in terms of racial issues and those kind of things. So, so we, you've got to be careful about that. But understand that God made humans as his special creation, that we are made in the image of God. That we are different than anything else God made. That we're not just an animal. See, one of my issues with scientific naturalism has nothing to do with the contradictory evidence with Scripture. My biggest issue with scientific naturalism is just how meaningless it makes life. I mean, if you are just a pile of goo that came together randomly, and you're just a combination of minerals and chemicals and you know, electric react, uh, electric impulses and chemical reactions and all that. What is the meaning of life? There isn't any meaning of life. But if I know based on Scripture that God made me, knitted me together in my mother's womb, in His image, then I am fundamentally different than any other animal that exists. Now, I love my dog. Okay? We can have a goldfish. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with goldfish, but that's not the point. Um, 
You know, we, I, I don't dislike animals. Some of y'all love your animals. That's great. But you know what? Your animals are not created in the image of God. You are. You are much more valuable than they are. That in and of itself has tremendous impact when it comes to understanding the, the true value of life. From conception to death, human life is intrinsically valuable because we're made in the image of God. Okay. Creation tells us that. Science doesn't. Okay. I mean, if you know, usually they would say that the only difference between humans and animals are the ability to communicate. You know, I read not long ago that dolphins, they've actually proven that dolphins have a language that they talk to each other with. You know, so we're, in science's views, we're no different than Flipper. Okay? Maybe Flipper's smarter than we are, I don't know. Y'all know that the, the dolphin that played Flipper killed, committed suicide. Did y'all know that? After the show Flipper was canceled, the dolphin, one of the dolphins that played Flipper was in a, like an aquarium and was really depressed. And one day was in the tank with the trainer and like went up and like nuzzled the trainer and then like swam and like went down to the bottom and killed herself. Thinking, really? But yeah, that's what happened. Look it up. Okay. How? Well, if dolphins, dolphins have to breathe air, because dolphins are mammals, so if the dolphin doesn't come up to breathe, they suffocate, so that's what the dolphin did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so God made humanity a special creation. Thirdly, humanity is currently in a fallen state due to willful rebellion against God. That's what Genesis 3 teaches us. That, that's true. And okay? we have to accept that. Science doesn't deal with that. Okay. And then lastly, Jesus is the only means of salvation. Now, these are the theological truths that we all have to agree on. Like I said, these five theories I presented, you spent a lot of time on them, and they sound good, and you pick which one you like or which one you don't like or whatever. Those four things at the bottom, hold to those firmly. Okay? So we've got a couple minutes. Any questions? And don't ask me which theory I hold to because I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> That gets you in trouble. Any questions? So there was no one, there were no, no one was created except through man and woman after the flood. Well, yeah, no one, his family, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So everything went back to Noah and his family from there on out. Yeah. Uh, and there are some folks that take that and, and, and kind of run with it a little bit and say that Cain's wife, that God may have actually created other people um, besides Adam and Eve, and that's where Cain's wife came from, so that those people were wiped out at the flood, that Noah is a descendant of Adam, therefore that solves that question. So when you have people that build all kinds of gymnastics to kind of answer these questions, but the Bible doesn't ask that question, so... You know, if God didn't think it was important enough to give an answer, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. You know, I'll lose sleep over taking Mucinex, but not over giving this thing to And isn't that, and, and when it comes right down to it, <clears throat> isn't that the case with a lot of things that science asks a lot of questions? that the Bible doesn't specifically address because it's science trying to disprove something that's not really an issue for a Christian? Um, yes, but, but I, I would you know, clarify that slightly by saying that the scientific method approaches these issues without a preconceived notion of what's going to be found. So if someone is intentionally trying to disprove the Bible, they have already biased their conclusions. And that is inherently not scientific. Okay. Science would say, 
you do the you, you do the research, you look at the evidence, you draw the conclusions, what the conclusions say, that's what you go with. Um, someone who goes in and say, well, I, there can't be a God, this story can't be true, so I'm going to find evidence that says, oh, you're going to find what you're looking for if you're looking for that. Okay. But, but you're leading the yeah. question at that point. So, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I would just venture to say that, you know, throughout history, most of the, the great scientists of, you know, the last thousand years were Christians, up until the last 175 years. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. they may, maybe not Orthodox Christians, maybe not, you know, evangelical Christians, but people who believed in God and, and affirmed faith in Christ. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, look at Elvis Scott Peck, um, you know, he's a um, the Red Lips Travel, then he starts the book off by saying that <clears throat> when you graduate from medical school, he would he said that there was no such thing as a miracle, and he said by the time he finished his um, clinical training as a doctor, he said we don't um, make it through one day without one. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, he 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 became a Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, based on what he saw. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, there are people in heaven who believe that God did it all over billions of years. And there are people in heaven who believe God did it 6,000 years ago. And guess what? When we're there, we're all good. <coughs> okay. And when we get there, we can just ask him. And he'll say he did it on a Thursday on September the 15th, 2004 right. BC at 3 in the afternoon. I mean, that's... <laughs> no, it's totally right. <laughs> All right, anything else? And then we'll pray. All right. Um, next week, we're actually going to have a special uh, visitor in here with us uh, as part of our preparations for Advent. So we're prepared for that. And so we'll pick up on the miracle question in two weeks. So um, you can ask Tamar some questions next week. So. Read that story in Genesis of Tamar and come prepared to ask a question. Okay. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, the truth that you are the one who made everything. And so, Father, I just pray that as we deal with these questions, we deal with these issues, we search for answers, or that you give us wisdom you know, to live well in the world that you have made. And we thank you uh, for each one here. And we pray your blessings on each one. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.